Okay, so first of all, it is a great pleasure and it's a big honor to be here today and to contribute to the celebration of ENSO. And uh, different from many other people in the, in the audience, I don't have a scientific history to share with ENSO because yes, 600 papers, I have 400 papers, so altogether 1,000 papers, but we don't have a paper together. So we should fix that soon. At least statistically, we should have won. So it's a, it's a great pleasure. We have, we have something in common because we have been birthed the same day, November 8, but I'm much, much, much younger than he is. <laughs> okay, so today I, I will present uh, a talk about uh, solids and magnetic impurity in solids. I will raise some problems, uh, which I hope can be of some interest to you. Now, uh, this is just an outline of what I want to cover. I will first uh, discuss briefly uh, the case of an aluminum impurity in silicon dioxide. Uh, and then I uh, will discuss uh, the case of nitrogen uh, into, uh, dopants in three materials, titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, and magnesium oxide. Now, what is the common denominator? Uh, when you introduce this kind of impurities in a, in a solid material, you also introduce uh, magnetic impurities, magnetic states. So we want to describe these magnetic states, and also we want to uh, compare the theoretical results with experiment. And in this respect, there is a very important role of electron paramagnetic resonance or electron spin resonance. And I uh, pick up this uh, topic because uh, among the various contributions that Enzo gave, uh, I mean, there is certainly a contribution to the uh, reproduction of APR properties. And so this is very important, in particular because, as I will show, and that's it's the underlying uh, uh, concept of my talk, uh, density functional theory has problems in describing this kind of uh, magnetic in, uh, impurities, and we often need to compare with experiment. And so we need solid experiments to validate our theory. So I will start with a story which is not new. Actually, uh, it goes back a long time ago. Uh, an al aluminum impurity in silicon dioxide. So if you have silicon dioxide, silicon is four-valent, tetravalent. If you replace one silicon atom with an aluminum atom, which is trivalent, you introduce a hole. And so you have a magnetic impurity. This is well known since a long time. So we go back to uh, the 50, year, 50 years when the first APR experiments have been reported on this system. But actually, uh, the real full characterization was done by this guy, John Weil, a superb electron spin resonance spectroscopist who did a very careful job work in the 80s. And he also combined his APR experiments with artifact calculations on very simple models, showing that when you introduce an aluminum atom in the tetrahedron, which was previously formed by silicon atom, then you, have, you create a hole, and the hole localizes on a single oxygen. Now, I met John Weil in the, around the year 2000 because I was working on various defects on silicon dioxide, and he pointed to me a problem and said, well, look, I am very disappointed because all my work is going to be forgotten or is going to be, uh, become controversial because a few papers that came out in the literature where my model is substantially destroyed. The first paper, in fact, uh, that he was referring to, appeared in 1996 in Physical Review B, where people used for the first time density functional theory in the local density approximation to describe this particular system. And they concluded that actually, yes, you have a hole, but the hole is delocalized over all four oxygens around your aluminum atom. There was an improved Theory, theoretical description, we came out in 2000, again in Physical Review B, where people used now G uh, GGA, and, but again, they found complete hole delocalization around the aluminum atom, and here they really challenged the experiment, and they concluded the experiment was misinterpreted. And actually, in the same year, a third paper came out, again in Physical Review B, again GGA, but with the same conclusion complete all delocalization around aluminum. 
And so John Weil asked us to check and to see what, what was the origin of this and what was the discrepancy. And so at that time we were working with cluster models, so just a local representation of your defect in a solid. Of course, in that case, you have to increase the size of your cluster, and we were using cl typical and uh, classical uh, quantum chemical approaches like QMMM. And what we, what we found is that if you computed the wave function at the artery fork level, we found a full localization of the unpaired electron on a single oxygen. We tried also to do limited CI calculation to see if there was an effect of a correlation to basically delocalize this electron. But actually, we were uh, coming to the same result, single hole on a single oxygen. So we, at the point, we also did DFT calculations, and at, immediately we saw this delocalization effect. No matter which functional we were using, not only classical GGA functionals like the P, uh, PD, PW91, but also hybrid functionals like a bitrolip were giving a complete delocalized hole around the aluminum impurity. So where is the true? Is artery fork which gives you a fully localized hole, or is a DFT that gives you a fully delocalized hole? Here is where electron spin resonance come in place, because it is extremely important. Of course, electron spin resonance, you have two important uh, observable quantities. One is the G tensor, but the other is the hyperfine coupling constant. And actually, in the hyperfine coupling constants, what you measure is the interaction of the electron spin with a nuclear spin. And this provides very direct information about the, di the distribution of a spin around the nuclei. And let me also point out that the A tensor is composed by a, a part which is isotropic and a, a dipolar part, which again tells you very detailed uh, information about the symmetry of the orbitals where the electron is localized. And if you, when we did the calculation of the spin uh, hyperfine uh, coupling constants for this special case, aluminum doped silicon dioxide, you, we immediately realized that the Twitterlip description was very far off compared to experiment. While Arthur Falk look in particular at the, at, the, at the dipolar part for 17 oxygen isotopes was very well described. Not only that, also the so-called super hyperfine, so the interaction of electron spin with the next near, near, nearest neighbor nucleus, which is aluminum, was properly described at the artery fork level and completely wrong at the DFT level. Okay, so at that point, we concluded that artery fork provides the correct physical picture, while DFT not. Now it is realized that in order to get the proper localization, you need at least at least 40% of artery fork exchange, fork exchange in your DFT. So bitter lip is not enough, and every other normal functional is not enough. So this has become a, a, a classical case, and there are many, many papers when people want to study a new self-interaction-corrected -interac functional, and we want to test it on a solid system, they use this as a benchmark. This is the last paper by John Robertson, because it is a very delicate uh, case where you may uh, test your method. But of course, what we learn is that, of course, DFT has problems with self-interaction description, but there is a very negative message. The predictive level of theory in this case is, is extremely low. Without the experiment, we cannot have a firm conclusion about the distribution of the impaired electron. So we need clean experimental data, and in particular, electron spin resonance. But this is not always available. OK, so is the first uh, point. I will come back to this at the end of my talk. And now we'll try to make a connection between this uh, part and uh, the problem of nitrogen doping in these three different materials. I will first describe uh, the general nature of nitrogen dopants in TiO2, zinc oxide, and magnesium oxide. And I will, I will come to another problem, because when you have magnetic impurities in a material, they can interact and they can give, a, 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 give out to a magnetic ordering, ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic. And here again, in particular for the case of nitrogen dope, magnesium oxide, I will discuss another problem. So let's start first with nitrogen doping of oxides. Why people are studying so heavily nitrogen doping? Well, there are many reasons. 
I will uh, mention a few of them. So there are various ways to introduce a dope antinematerial experimentally. So here are just a list of possible synthetic procedures. Of course, it is very difficult to know once you have done the synthesis to know exactly what kind of uh, system you have. So the characterization from an experimental point of view is not so straightforward. And uh, in particular, the position and the nature of the dopant is rarely well described by experiment. So that's why theory can be very important. So all what I'm going to show now is not done at the molecular level, but is done with a solid state approach. And we use for this the crystal code, which has been de developed at the University of Torino, which is, I think many of the people here in the audience are familiar with this. It is based on localized atomic orbitals, Ga Gaussian atomic functions. And that's why people have been able to use hybrid functionals for solids already in 1997, 1998. And I have to say that nowadays, hybrid functionals have been implemented also in plane wave codes. And they have become very popular also in the solid state physics community. But uh, thanks to the uh, possibility, possibility to use uh, atomic orbital basis functions, this has been possible also uh, with this particular code much earlier. We are, we are using b lip for all the calculation I'm going to show you. Of course, there are better hybrid functions nowadays, but we still continue to use b lip The main reason is that there is no single function that fix all the problems. And finally, staying with Bitrelip, we have at least a very large set of data which are all taken on the same footing. So we can compare systems at a molecular or at a solid state level, and we don't have to worry too much about the differences which are introduced by the treatment. Okay, TiO2, nitrogen doping, why people have been, there are more than 1,000 papers which have been published on this system in the last decade. Well, the story is interesting because of a wrong paper in science. There was a paper in science in 2000 where people claimed that by doping nitro TiO2 with nitrogen, you can really improve the absorption of solar light and obtain very active photocatalyst. That has stimulated a huge amount of work. Unfortunately, that was not true. But that is another story. Okay, so the idea is that by doping the material, you may improve the photoactivity. So what happens when you introduce nitrogen in the TiO2? Well, you can put nitrogen either in a substitutional position, so nitrogen replaces an oxygen atom, or you can place it in an interstitial site. This is typical in solids. There are, there are two, these two possibilities. If it is interstitial, well, what you have is that the nitrogen levels are slightly above the top of the valence band. Of course, since you have one electron uh, missing in nitrogen compared to oxygen, we have an ampere spin, and this is entirely localized on the nitrogen atom. When you put this nitrogen atom in the interstitial position, the nitrogen atoms doesn't want to stay in the cavity. It binds to an oxygen and forms a kind of NO. Uh, this is a really kind of NO molecule in the lattice. Again, this introduces states in the gap, and again, it is a very localized kind of pi orbital of an NO molecule. Now, we have computed the APR properties, both uh, the isotropic and the dipolar part of the APR tensor, uh, and we have compared it with experiment, experiments because, luckily enough, the group of Elio Giamello in Torino has been able to produce nitrogen-doped samples and to measure the hyperfine coupling constants. Now, you see that both interstitial and substitutional nitrogen, they have hyperfine tensors which are not so different from the experimental one. Actually, you see that the interstitial is much closer to the experimental value. It would not be sufficient to use these small differences uh, to conclude that nitrogen is interstitial. However, here we have also another kind of measurement, which is XPS, X-ray photo emission spectroscopy. And due to the comparison with experiment here, we can conclude unambiguously that nitrogen in TiO2 goes in interstitial positions. But the point is that we can reproduce very nicely the electron spin resonance uh, parameters, which indicates that we know that the electron is quite localized around, around the nitrogen atom. Now, zinc oxide. Why people want to dope zinc oxide with nitrogen? Well, here there are at least two different reasons. One is, again, 
uh, improving the activity in the visible light of potential uh, catalyst. Semiconductor oxides have a band gap, which usually is at the edge of a solar light, so you can improve solar light absorption and activity. So that is one of the reasons. The other one is that zinc oxide is used in various electronic uh, materials, and people want to dope it and to make it a P-type conductor, so it conductivity by holes. And people have tried many different dopants. Most of them don't, don't work, and nitrogen is a possibility. So again, we did calculations on nitrogen doping on zinc oxide. Again, this is the band gap, gap that we uh, compute with bitter lip, which is exactly the experimental one. In TiO2, it is slightly overestimated. When you put nitrogen in, in, in substitutional positions, again, we have uh, states slightly above the band gap. There is the empty component. These are the alpha. These are the beta component. There is a beta 2p orbital, which is empty and is in the mid gap. When nitrogen goes interstitial, we have a very similar situation to what we have seen in TiO2. So the nitrogen binds to an oxygen and forms a kind of NO complex. The states are a bit higher in the gap. But the picture is very similar to what we have in TiO2. OK, again, here our experimental colleagues have been able to prepare nitrogen doped zinc oxide. So they took zinc oxide powders, they exposed it to nitrogen and they annealed in, 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 sorry, to ammonia, and then they get very clear signatures inducing, in, in, indicating that you have nitrogen impurities in the material. Here are the uh, computed electron spin resonance properties, and here you see that if nitrogen is substitutional, we have an excellent agreement with the experimental value. If it is interstitial, the agreement is much worse. Not only that, even if you do an analysis of the thermodynamic stability of the two different impurities, we conclude that nitrogen substitution is preferred. Again, I would like to point out the extreme accuracy of the reproduction of these uh, parameters, which again indicates very strong localization. Let's come to the third material, which is magnesium oxide. Where, why people want to dope magnesium oxide, which is a wide gap insulator with nitrogen? Okay, one, may, one important reason is related to the use of these materials in spintronics. Spintronics is a, a very new field, I mean, uh, where you want to use this electron spin in order to do a new kind of electronics. And uh, they, uh, these systems are used in um, the so-called magnetic RAM, so you, you have ultra-thin films of an insulator, like magnesium oxide, between two magnetic electrodes, like iron. And so the idea is to induce magnetism into an oxide which is intrinsically non-magnetic, magnesium oxide. So the idea is to, to put nitrogen impurities, generate spins, and generate a magnetic ordering. That is the key aspect. So this is a topic which has attracted a lot of interest in the literature uh, after this paper came out in Physical Review Letters a few years ago because uh, the group of Savatsky was able to show that for strontium oxide, nitrogen doping introduced holes in the system. We were not able to measure any magnetic interaction, but essentially these measurements, I'm pointing here the X-ray absorption spectra or the X-ray photoemission, I don't want to go into detail now, were clearly indicating that you have one hole in the 2p state of a nitrogen atom. So it has been possible to generate this nitrogen impurity in zirconium oxide. So we did the calculations for magnesium oxide, and again, we may have a nitrogen atom which replaces a an oxygen in the lattice, so substitutional, and again, we have states of nitrogen which are slightly above the top of the valence band, and please notice this state because we'll become in a moment into this discussion. Of course, we have a 2p state which is empty, which shows up as a state in the mid-gap, about 3.3 EV above the top of the valence band. The other situation is that where nitrogen is in interstitial position, and again, the nitrogen wants to bind to oxygen, form a kind of NO complex, and again, we have states in the gap 
more or less where they were in zinc oxide and TiO2. So these are the calculations. Also in this case, we went back to our experimental colleagues. Of course, usually it's the opposite. Usually experimentalists come to you and say, yeah, I have a problem, please do the calculation. Sometimes it's also nice to try the opposite, say, I have the calculation, please do the experiment. So they did, I mean, first of all, I have to show this. So here we computed the hyperfine coupling constants, and uh, here we did it with both periodic and cluster models. So we have a nice set of results to compare with experiment. But the experimentalists tried, and finally they found a way to produce a nitrogen dope magnesium oxide. They did many attempts, that was not easy. Uh, just for those of you who may be interested they, interested, they started from the magnesium nitride. They oxidized magnesium nitride. This is the X-ray diffusion pattern of magnesium nitride. And at the end of the oxidation process, you get the typical diffraction pattern of magnesium oxide. So you completely change the structure, but since you start from a nitride, you keep some impurities. And in fact, measuring the electron spin resonance, they clearly had evidence of two different magnetic impurities in the material. So the hope was that one of these was a nitrogen impurity in the magnesium oxide. Okay, the, it, it, the analysis uh, showed clearly that the first kind, the type 1 impurity, was a kind of O minus species. So it's an oxygen radical which can form into the material. The second species, was associated to nitrogen, but was not a nitrogen atom in the lattice, was or is a nitrogen 2 minus species which has formed during the synthesis. How do we know that? Because here we were able to compute not only the hyperfine, but also the G tensor. In yellow is the experimental, in white is the theoretical one. You see that there is really an extremely good agreement. So we form N2 minus species, not nitrogen molecules. This is not what we wanted. It's not nitrogen atoms forming uh, either in substitutional or interstitial positions. So this was where we went, and at a given point we said, okay, we have to give up. We have no way to introduce nitrogen where we want. But in 2010, a new study appeared by a very distinguished group, a group of Stuart Parking at IBM. And there is a thesis from 2010, they used a different method, they used a molecular beam epitaxy. And with molecular beam epitaxy, they did produce nitrogen dope magnesium oxide. Uh, now, I don't want to go into the details, but first of all, they, they, sh they, show, they, they saw a, a lattice constant increase when the nitrogen is incorporated, so they concluded nitrogen is uh, interstitial. But then, after annealing, they saw the lattice constant go back to the original position, so they concluded nitrogen is substitutional. But most important, what they did, they did measure a typical uh, um, hysteresis curve, and they did measure ferromagnetic ordering. So, this, in fact, it has been patented. This is a very important result. It's the first time that you can produce a, a typical insulating and diamagnetic oxide making, making, uh, making magnetic. The interesting thing is that they found that the average magnetic moment per nitrogen atom is about 0.35 Bohr magnesium per nitrogen, not one. They have done a lot of other characterizations. I don't want to go to in, into the details, but the so-called valence band photomission spectroscopy shows that the nitrogen states are above the oxygen to p valence band, which is what we found in the calculations. They found clearly that there is one hole in the 2p orbital of nitrogen, which is what we found in the calculations. And then they also did a kind of estimate where is the empty state? Where is this 2p empty state? And they concluded it's about 3.8 eV above the top of the valence band. We compute 3.3, but we have to be very careful because these are consham levels. However, this strong exchange splitting is a clear sign of a strong localization of the unpaired electron. So, good news. There are a number of agreements between the calculations that we did and these new experiments. As I said, the nitrogen states are about 0.8 eV above the top of the 
valence band. There, is, there are holes in the 2p orbitals of nitrogen, and the empty state is more or less in the same position. However, there are also a number of problems. We calculate almost a full unpaired electron on nitrogen, so a full spin localization on nitrogen, where the experiment seems to indicate something like one third. Not only that, there is another experiment that they have analyzed, which is near X-ray absorption fine structure. And based on that, they conclude that there is some hole also in the oxygen. This would be consistent with the fact that the, the hole is not entirely localized, it's partly delocalized. And that is not what we found. So there would be, it would be extremely interesting to have an electron spin resonance analysis of this system. But this is missing because this has been produced as a thin film and it's not possible to do an APR on the thin film. You should scratch the powder. That's not trivial. Now, if you go into the literature, you find a lot of theoretical studies on the system. These people have been studying theoretically before the experiment has been done the magnetic properties of nitrogen dope magnesium oxide. This is work done by Blugel. They used LDA, and they also used a random phase, phase approximation to compute the Curie temperature, the transition temperature where the magnetic ordering starts to appear. Okay, well, they concluded that magnesium oxide doped with nitrogen is a ferromagnet, that you have indeed something like 0.5 electrons on or holes on the nitrogen, and the rest is distributed on the oxygen neighbors, which is uh, consistent with the experiment I've shown you. Uh, basically, the system is described as what is called an half metal. What does it mean, an half metal? So the nitrogen 2p states, they form not isolated state levels, but two bands. The alpha band is fully occupied, the beta component is a band, it is crossed by the Fermi level. That's why it is called a metal. But it's half metal because it has spin polarization. So it is a typical uh, case of magnetic, mag magnetic properties of, uh, of materials. But this is LDA. Now, if you use LDA, and we go back to the aluminum impurity in silicon dioxide, well, if you do any kind of self-interaction corrected DFT, as I told you, the hole is entirely localized, and the ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic solutions, they differ by one millielectron volt. That means the spins are so localized, they don't talk each other. If you do it LDA, you find that aluminum dope SCl2 is a ferromagnet, and it has an anti-ferromagnetic uh, phase, which is 120 millielectron volts higher in energy. But these two phases do not exist in silicon dioxide. So that is never been observed. OK, so we have a kind of problems. Because, of course, one could say, well, what we have calculated so far are very diluted impurities, 2%, 3%. What happens if you put more? OK, here is the answer. So we put 3%, 6%, 12% of nitrogen in the material. Because, of course, the more dopants you put, the broader becomes uh, the bands. And in principle, you could go to this kind of half metal situation that I have described here. But here are the data. Of course, by increasing the concentration, you increase the bandwidth. It is 0.1 heavy here. It is 1.5 EV, so the, the dopants start to see each other, start to interact. But still, you see that this empty state, empty component is still well separated from the other state. So there is still a gap. There is no half metal this is an insulator. And uh, again, this is obtained at the bitter leap level. So much, probably much larger nitrogen concentration would be needed in order to see the half metal behavior. But I tell you, nobody is able to put more than a few percent of a dopant in these materials. Otherwise, you see phase segregation and so on. So let me come to the conclusions. We have seen that by, uh, people can introduce dopants into various materials. By comparing theory with experiment, we can decide or we can assign uh, the position of the dopant, interstitial, substitutional, we don't know exactly on magnesium oxide because there is no experiment. The point of interest is if, if we collect now all our data, 
So we look at the hyperfine coupling constants for nitrogen in substitutional position or nitrogen in interstitial positions, and we compare three completely different materials, TiO2, zinc oxide, and magnesium oxide, where, please notice, the coordination of a nitrogen atom is completely different. The band gap is completely different. So we are comparing completely different situations, yet, if you look in particular at the dipolar part of a tensor, this is almost identical in the three cases. What does it mean? It means that the unpaired electron is very localized. It doesn't really matter what is around. We know, because for TiO2 and zinc oxide, we are lucky enough, we know that TiO2 and zinc oxide are properly described at the level of theory that we are using here. We don't have experimental data for magnesium oxide, but we don't have even reasons to think that it is wrong only magnesium oxide compared to our other two systems. So the message is the system, the whole is very localized. The unpaired electron and the, uh, is, is, do not interact. So the or origin of the magnetic ordering remains mysterious. So I have a, there is a, di a dilemma at this point. Because if you do what I consider a proper treatment of electronic structure with hybrid functionals, proper description of a band gap, then there is no way to explain how you get room temperature ferromagnetism in these systems. If you do what I consider an incorrect description, like LDA, then you, put, you, you, you get ferromagnetism for diluted magnetic impurities in semiconducting or insulating oxides. I have to say, however, that this is taken from a review, recent review on uh, experiments on these systems, uh, this is really a delicate topic. Because uh, over the past decades, a lot of research has, has been done to try to get this dilute doping of uh, oxides. This effort is aimed at introducing spin functionalities and uh, novel magnetotransport in such oxides. After an early excitement, and in spite of some very promising results reported in the literature, this field has continued to be dogged by concerns regarding uniformity of dopants incorporation, possibility of secondary ferromagnetic phases, and cont contamination issues. So it is very delicate from the experimental point of view. But here we have a di dilemma. If experiments that I've shown you, which are not yet published, but I met uh, Stuart Parking in September, and he said, we want to publish, but we don't understand the ferromagnetism. So we believe that the experiments are correct. If experiments are correct, then we have a problem in the theory. If theory is correct, then we have a problem in the experiment. With that, I would like to thank the people who did the work, in particular, Cristiana Di Valentin, who is a person in my group, which, uh, who is doing all the work on the semiconducting oxides and their doping. Of course, I want to thank our experimental colleagues, Elio Giamello in Torino, for the beautiful experimental work that uh, they have done. And I cannot conclude without saying thanks to uh, Enzo and to uh, say Auguri. This picture has been taken in 1993, and you see there are some common things about, among these people. There are all theoreticians, and all had a beard, but now we have no beard anymore. So, well, that is something that we also have to fix. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Pacchioni, and now it's time for questions and comments. Yeah. Uh, I just would like to, very interesting, this uh, part of uh, ferromagnetism. I just was to make a comment and to mention something that we found. You know what, we work a lot on these magnetic interactions on the, on the dinuclear complexes. Yeah. Well, this hybrid functionals work very well for the antiferromagnetic coupling, but we, we found that they, they are really problems in describing the ferromagnetic interactions. And I think this is maybe okay. similar to what you found. We can, like, we, this is not yet published, but, okay. but we can... I'm looking for solutions, yeah. Good. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I just have a question and a comment. Isn't it dangerous to limit the comparison of the theoretical results to match the experiment? Can, don't we look at higher level of theory for choosing the best method to compare with the experiment, to be really predictive? 
you are completely right, but when you talk, uh, are talking about solids, that's not so easy. For molecules, it's absolutely clear. But for solids, it's not so clear. So in particular, when we go to the problem of these um, semiconducting oxides, the problem of the calculation of the band gap is a highly debated topic. Of course, there are better methods like GW and so on. But even when you compare the best GW estimation of the band gap with the best experimental values, there are discrepancies that may be due either to the theory or sometimes even to experiment. Because again, we may have an excitons contribution to the band gap. So it is really not like doing benchmarking for molecules. That is a real problem. And I have to say, unfortunately, the pre I repeat that the predictive theory, uh, predictive, the power of theory in, in these days on these systems is not terribly high. Because if you change the hybrid functional or you change the DFT plus U approach, you get different results. Is the fact that spins are kept collinear a limit on the predictive power theory here? Could, could be, could I mean, be. I, I've seen yeah. one ampered electron per yeah. side, so yeah. maybe a collinear description is, is still okay. Yeah. But it can get pretty yeah, of course. different of when spins are allowed to be non-collinear. That, that is a possibility. Still, I mean, still uh, at that level of interaction, of interaction, I expect for this kind of description still to be extremely low. Not such to have room temper of ferromagnetism. But you are completely right. You may have non-collinear uh, alignments. OK. 